Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's meeting. As we proceed to continue in this study, as we proceed to examine these documents, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction. We are not looking to be critical, but we are looking to be able to defend the faith that is with us and in us and to understand some of what we are going to be facing here in the times that are just before us. Shall we now ask for for our Heavenly Father's guidance? Loving Father in heaven, we have sinned and we fall short of your glory. Yet we need your direction. We need your guidance and we need your blessing. As we assemble today, help us now to understand that which you would have us to know. We know that we may be called before kings and queens, before rulers, before magistrates, to give an answer for the faith that is, be, that is in, within us. Help us that we may honor your character and honor your name in all that we do and all that we say. May your angels attend us today. May your spirit enlighten us, directing us in the path that we should be walking. Help us to this end. I thank you for each one that is here today, and thank you for the conversation that we will have that will be directed by you and by your spirit. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we left off yesterday in Pruitt's conclusion regarding the phrase. Pruitt states, there is no evidence that I can see in scripture that the number seven or any adverbial number has ever been based substantively, that is, as a noun, to indicate seven periods of time. There is abundant evidence that when seven periods of time are intended, The number is used with a noun to indicate the fact. Now, Pruitt takes a position that has been shared by many within the church historically. Can we think of two such parties that are in agreement with Pruitt? Well, historically, I mean, we have Uriah Smith. Correct. And who is another one? Consider this, people, that Eugene Pruitt is very much in agreement here with Desmond Ford. Okay. Well, Desmond Ford doesn't uh, address the 2520 directly, but he does uh, address other time periods. From what I have read, what I have heard Ford speaking and what I have observed. Desmond Ford believed that William Miller was wrong in his calculations. Mm -hmm. Now, Uriah Smith takes much the same position. It's just that he attempts to come at it from a linguistic manner. Now, of course, he's not addressing William Miller's understanding of the 2520, particularly or directly. He's addressing, um, you know, that is Uriah Smith is addressing other uses of it. Now, Pruitt, though, is taking that argument and applying it to, to Miller. But, of course, obviously, Uriah Smith can accept the 2520 by Miller if he's going to make this argument. But it's, it, you know, this is a more direct attack on Miller by Pruitt and Desmond Ford, uh, not as direct in Uriah, by Uriah Smith. He's not openly addressing Miller's understanding. I guess the, the overall point that I'm looking at, taking Uriah Smith as an example of a generation that does not understand 
following with mm-hmm. Leroy Froom, Roy Allen Anderson, Reed, and the other members of Frida, progressing then to Ford, we now have literally people that understand nothing of what the pioneers came to understand. Yeah, you know, the one question I have dealing with Uriah Smith and how he's addressing Leviticus 26, you know, the question is how much did he recognize what he was doing? Like, did he know about the 2520? Did he understand the pioneer's view on Leviticus 26? Or was his mind completely blinded to it? Um, Because one is, you could argue that Miller was correct in having the 25, 20 year period, but that some of his ways that he viewed the passage was incorrect. And so a person could still retain uh, a belief in the 25, 20 as Miller's prophetic periods, and yet not agree with the arguments that were used. Now, of course, he's gonna say there is no 25, 20 okay. period. But I've also argued that there is no 2520 period, you know, the period of 2500, you know, 2520 years for literal Israel found in Leviticus 26. And I have made an argument that Leviticus 26 is fulfilled by periods of 70 years and 140 years for literal Israel. That where we find the 2520, is actually in Daniel. But Daniel does use Leviticus 26 in order to produce the 2520. That is, you can say that the prophecies of Daniel are an application of the seven of Leviticus 26. Because if if you look at how I've done it, how I've constructed the 2520, at least in my understanding of it, because I didn't construct it, but, I looked at the fulfillment of Leviticus 26. I saw it was fulfilled literally for Judah. And then um, I understood the connection between the prophecies of Daniel. And the first thing that we see is that Daniel is going to recognize that there's a period of 70 years. And he's going to pray about it in Daniel chapter 9. And then he's going to be given a period of 70 weeks. And that period of 70 weeks is based upon a period of 490 years that does come from Leviticus 26, right? So the 490 years that are necessary for the 70 years captivity. And so his 70 weeks are going to be based upon that 490 years. And that 70 weeks is going to commence the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. So the start of the 70 weeks is also going to commence the start of the 2300 days. But what you end up with is a de facto 25, 20 year period from Leviticus 26 based upon the literal fulfillment of Leviticus 26 for Judah without making that direct connection that Miller does. That is, you could you could argue and say, okay, you know, there is not a 25, 20 year period for Leviticus in Leviticus 26 for Judah. But yet it still does exist because of Daniel. So that was basically the argument I made back in 2015. I presented it in the paper. A lot of people were upset about that paper. But but I still think it's it's valid. I don't think that you can just go directly from the idea of seven times and then multiply it by 360 without the steps that are taken in the book of Daniel. Because in the book of Daniel, we need the 70 weeks to transfer the blessings and curses from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. And we need the 2300 days. We to need stand. Trans- you dropped out there. That- first. You dropped out. Yeah. Okay. So we need the 70 weeks to transfer the blessings and curses from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. Right? Correct. 
But you also need that for the 2300 days, right? No disagreement. Yeah. And then the 2300 days are going to extend the blessings and curses and other things, but I mean, specifically the sanctuary. And it's, it's cleansing into the Millerite time period. So that by necessity extends this prophecy of Leviticus 26 to become a period of 25, 20 years, right? So, and, and that's the thing that he's going to miss here because he's going to go through Leviticus 26, crew it is, and, and he's going to almost see this, but he doesn't, right? And if he had seen it, you know, maybe he would have had a different view of it. But, and then the thing is, we can show the 2520 for Northern Israel without using Leviticus 26. Now, of course, we still kind of need Daniel 27, verse 25 and 12, verse 7 to sort of um, authenticate it, right? But, 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 so Daniel 20, you know, Daniel 7:25 and 12:7 are based upon Leviticus 26. That's why Daniel can use the time times and a half because of Leviticus 26, he couldn't do that otherwise. So, so there still is this dependency upon Levit- Leviticus 26. But, but hopefully that's clear to people. You know how I understand the 25:20, but I don't think it's just directly comes from Leviticus 26 without these other steps. Well, Pruitt makes his his next statement as we came to this yesterday. So the pioneers that wrote about Leviticus 26, Bates, Edson, and Smith, the latter, or Smith, appears to be closer to Wright than the others. So he is definitely attempting to lift up Uriah Smith as being correct and he is stating that Captain Bates and Hiram Edson were incorrect. In a way, he is also then attacking Miller because he doesn't wish to put Miller's name in here to say Miller was incorrect, but by inference, that's there. Yeah. Now, you know, and if if Smith had said all of this stuff that there's no 25, 20 year period or whatever in Leviticus 26, and then said it's fulfilled in periods of 70 years by by Judah, and that the three decrees uh, are going to end these periods of 70 years and the 140 year period, and then after a period of 220 years, and those three decrees are going to, you know, begin the 2300 days and said, you know, there just happens to be a 25, 20 year period that still exists. Um, you know, all of his earlier argument wouldn't have been an attack on Miller, right? I mean, right. he would have said Miller right. got the right answer, but, you know, he didn't really show his work properly. And And I actually think that Miller did understand it to some degree more than than um, most people see. That is, he understood it based upon the sabbatical cycle, right? So he didn't just say seven times. That means seven years. And we just, you know, it, it appears that he does it that way. But if you read carefully, he understood that it was based upon the sabbatical cycle. So he's taking that word seven and just seeing it as a symbol of a sabbatical cycle. So it's like parts of these things were understood by Miller, parts weren't, he didn't fully understand it. And then when people came and started examining it, they start to notice some of the problems, maybe we would say, but they don't give us, they don't give a thorough enough answer to resolve those problems. They're looking at it as a way like Smith is to dismiss a 25, 20 year period as existing at all. And we know that Smith still maintains the 677 BC date as beginning the kingdom of Babylon. So, so Smith would still have a de facto okay. period of 25, 20 years. He just 
doesn't think it comes from Leviticus 26, right? Right. He's still going to have, you know, 677 BC to 1844, but just, you know, that's it. Okay. Now, Pruitt then states, as of yet, we haven't even begun to study the content of Leviticus 26. He states the chapter begins with one of the most beautiful summaries of the covenant made with Abraham, the covenant that we call the new covenant today. He shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Is there any question with what's being said here? This is very direct. A, an instruction is being given to the children of Israel that they are not to worship idols. God reminds Israel of their obligation to the second and the fourth commandments, the very commandments that contain the gospel content in the Decalogue the very ones altered by the papacy. To a reminder of these precepts, God adds and reverence my sanctuary. <clears throat> Here are the focal truths for our age. Many distracting and side issues often claim our attention, but these deserve the attention that the side issues claim. And in the symbolic economy of the Jews, giving attention to these things, walking in God's statutes and in accordance with his commandments, brings rain in due season and a fruitful harvest. It is easy to perceive what kind of rain and which kind of fruitful harvest the church should look forward to today in response to these same conditions of faithfulness. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Now, um, so do I? Uh, sorry. Um, now, uh, I do have a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy where she starts at verse 3 and she quotes all the way to verse 20 of Leviticus 26. And then she uh, quotes from Deuteronomy 28. Um, so, Deuteronomy uh, what? 28. Because uh, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are sister chapters. Right. They're both addressing blessings and curses, right? So, so um, my understanding of it is, of course, Leviticus 26 is um, written before Deuteronomy 28. Leviticus 26 is written, um, Ellen White says, a few years after Mount Sinai. Right. So when it's written. And then we knew De no Deuteronomy 28 is written. Uh, 39 years after, right, almost 40 years after uh, Mount Sinai. So, so Deuteronomy 28 is going to be, once they go into the land, that's going to be addressed, the blessings and the curses. But first there is this prophecy in Leviticus 20, 26. Um, Deuteronomy 28, in a sense, adds to it. Um, okay. But... Uh, but we know in Leviticus 26, we're going to have this siege in the third seven times uh, that's going to be fulfilled by Jehoiachin's captivity uh, to Babylon. But in Deuteronomy 28, when they have the siege where that's described by Rome, so it's kind of interesting that Leviticus 26 addresses Babylon, but Deuteronomy 28 addresses Rome. Um, so it's another another interesting detail. Um, and then one other thing here, uh, when you look at this these these first two verses of Leviticus 26, and it talks about my Sabbath, it's not just referring to the weekly Sabbath or to the yearly Sabbaths, but also to uh, the sabbatical rest of the land. All of those would be included in my Sabbaths. Correct. Okay. Because it just doesn't say my Sabbath. My Sabbath. And so it's addressing uh, all of these these patterns, especially the ones 
that were just mentioned in chapter 25 of Leviticus, uh, the Jubilee and sabbatical cycles dealing with the land and so forth. And then, of course, this part of and reverence my sanctuary, I think becomes an important part of this whole prophecy. And it's just kind of, you know, just a reminder that's added, but I think it's actually really essential because the sanctuary is going to be addressed later in the prophecy. So the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the sanctuary are part of this prophecy. Okay. Now, Pruitt's point, before he gets into Leviticus 26, 5 to 8, was to state that God, what God promised was an Old Testament blessing of always fresh produce. The two harvests would last for months, food would be in abundance, and Israel would be safe. They would not, however, be passive. Their dominions would grow by unnatural victories, five persons putting a hundred to flight. Now, there's not a lot to be disagreed with here, except that Pruitt's statement of always fresh produce does fly in the face of the jubilee years well and sabbatical years yes right so the sabbatical years yeah so they're not always going to have fresh produce there is this uh they're going to be provided for but not always fresh i mean they can't eat and that, things that, that grow provision is provided harvest is going to be from very much an unnatural situation because they're going to rest in those sabbatical years. They're not going to sow. They're not going to reap. Yet they're going to have plenty of food. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. And ye shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. From this promise, it is as much from the story of Gideon, we are taught that God can accomplish his purposes by through many or by few. He mentions here, of course, Gideon, and one of the things Ellen White says in reference to these types of prophecies, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, is that they receive a partial fulfillment in the time of the judges. Right. But a more complete fulfillment of the captivity of Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon. So, so we know that, that, that there is an application of this that is, if people had repented, then the process does not continue on. And so so we know that there is times in which people disobeyed God, but they repented. And so we didn't get the complete um, cycle of, of the four seven times. You know, in the period of the judges, we don't, we don't have the four seven fo- times being fulfilled completely, just partially. Okay. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and I will be your God and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt that ye should not be their bondsmen. And I have broken the band, bands of your yoke and made you go upright. Following these wonderful promises, we find a solemn denunciation, and after that, a gospel promise that was claimed by the prophet Daniel. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning og that consume the eyes, 
and cause sorrow of the heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. So he continues here, note the seven items included in the denunciation. Now, it's strange that he could only find seven items. We have the appointed terror, the consumption, the burning og that destroys the eyes and brings misery, harvest eaten by enemies, death in battle, under hatred and hating rulers, and running when no one is chasing. These items are promised before the first seven in verse 18. The harvest thefts remind us of Gideon. The running when no one is chasing reminds us of the armies in the time of Saul. Hated rulers are a theme of the book of Judges. It's not just of the book of Judges, because there were hated rulers throughout. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Leviticus 26:18. The threat of verse 18 is for refusing to be reformed by the judgments listed above. A man that will not be reformed must need, needs be more thoroughly disciplined. The further discipline continues. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. This part of the curse sounds like that of Deuteronomy 28, especially verses 23 to 24. And as you were pointing out earlier, this is the sister chapter. This is the repeat of Leviticus 26 that Moses had to give to the children of Israel. Now, why would he need to repeat this? It's important. Exactly. Now, it's um, also because I think he had an understanding that the children of Israel were so stiff-necked that they had to have this presented multiple ways for them to understand what was going on. But but also we know that Leviticus 26 applies to Babylon. and Deuteronomy 28 is primarily going to apply to Rome. Okay. Which, which I think is important. Um, because it's going to address Rome. You know, the eagle, as the eagle flies, the uh, people of uh, a language you don't understand, right? And um, uh, of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences, right? Um, which is quoted in Daniel chapter 8 as being Rome. So um, now just uh, one other thing here, though. So he's going to, to notice that there is, seven different uh, natural uh, curses. And then he's going to address that, well, if they're not, if they're not re- reformed, they're not hearkened, they haven't hearkened to God, that he's going to punish them uh, seven times more for your sins. And then he's going to go into you know, what, what these punishments are, the breaking of your pride of your power. He, he doesn't address what that is. So so we know that that's going to be mentioned, that uh, Ephraim shall be broken, um, that it be not a kingdom, right, or be not a people. And that's going to be in Isaiah chapter 7, verse verse 8, right? In Isaiah chapter 7, um, we're going to have this being addressed. You know, if people had actually taken, if if he had taken the time to say, well, how was this actually specifically fulfilled? He would have, he would have been able to see this. Now, um, we'll go on and then I'm going to read a a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy regarding, um, that relates to this, to Leviticus 26. But uh, you can go on for now. Dwight disappeared there. So I I guess I will uh, just make another comment while he's not there. So I'm going to read this statement here from the Spirit of Prophecy. And and this this is a statement, um, the first time I ran across it, 
was uh, back in uh, 2015. And, and this was uh, the Sabbath school quarterly on the book of Jeremiah. I was, uh, that time, I can't remember if I was teaching Sabbath school. I don't think so. Um, but anyway, there's this quote uh, from prophets and kings. So, I mean, it's, it's not some hidden quote. So this quote begins, within a few short years of the king of, within a few short years, the king of Babylon was to be used as the instrument of God's wrath upon impedentant Judah. Again and again, Jerusalem was to be invested, that is, surrounded, and entered by the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar, company after company, at first a few only, but later on thousands and ten thousands were to be taken captive to the land of Shinar, there to dwell in enforced exile. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. All these Jewish kings were in turn to become vassals of the Babylonian ruler, and all in turn were to rebel. Severer and yet more severe chastisements were to be inflicted upon the rebellious nation, until at last the entire land was to become a desolation. Jerusalem was to be laid waste and burned with fire. The temple that Solomon had built was to be destroyed, and the kingdom of Judah was to fall, never again to occupy its former position among the nations of earth. So we know that um, uh, the, what really caught my attention was her listing Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. So under Jehoiakim, you're going to have Daniel's captivity in 607 in the fall. Uh, Jehoiachin, his captivity is going to be the third seven times. So Jehoiakim's is the second. Jehoiachin's is the third. And Zedekiah's uh, captivity is going to fulfill the fourth seven times. And we, she also mentions the severe and yet more severe chastisements. So we can see that Ellen White is going to, to connect here a progressive punishment that does increase in intensity, correct? So uh, Dwight, I just read from uh, Prophets and Kings page 42 okay. and 40, uh, 422 and 423. Okay. Um, where, where Ellen White talks about Nebuchadnezzar coming against uh, this progressive judgment, where it's sure. first going to be companies, and then later thousands and ten thousands are taken um, to the land of Shinar, there to dwell in enforced exile. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. All these Jewish kings were in turn to become vassals of the Babylonian ruler, and all in turn were to rebel. Severe and yet more severe chastisements were to be inflicted upon the rebellious nation until at last the entire land was to become desolate. And finally, uh, um, you know, the sanctuary is gonna be destroyed, et cetera. So here we have this idea of severe and yet more severe. So that is intensity, right? Increased intensity of these chastisements. And so to me, this seems like she is referring to Leviticus 26 and to the severe or more intense chastisements. And, and yet she also is recognizing Jehoiakim the second seven times, Jehoiachin the third seven times, and Zedekiah the fourth seven times. So if do you agree that this would be Leviticus 26 that she's referring to? I can't see a way of not agreeing. Yeah. And so if we argue for I think for that's pretty direct. Yeah. And if we argue for intensity, I mean, I would argue from Leviticus 26, obviously each of the chastisements are worse than the previous ones. Uh, the question is, does the seven times more, does the more have to do with intensity? And we would say, or and, and they don't really use the word more. They say that seven has to do with intensity. Now, Usually seven refers to completeness, right? Right. So we today we we're dealing with you know that it's intensity, um, but I don't see that seven ever is used as intensity. 
I mean, it can be used sort of mer- metaphorically as, as, as a type of completeness, but never as intensity. He never gave any examples of that it is intensity. And that's, that's the thing that always really bothered me. The intensity has to do with the fact that there's a repetition of these chastisements, and they're obviously progressing. But, you know, and, and even here when we deal with um, uh, prophets and kings, I mean, we have Manasseh's captivity that precedes all of this. So his is the first seven times. That is the breaking of the pride of power. Now, there is another quote in the Spirit of Prophecy, and this is in um, Manuscript 40, 1898. And, and that's where she's going to quote, uh, starting in verse 3, she's going to quote uh, all the way up to verse 20. So she's going to, uh, you know, quote, uh, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. She quotes up to there, your earth. I guess it's up to verse 19, maybe. Um, But anyway, she quotes all of the first seven times. And then she's going to quote from Deuteronomy. It shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe all his commandments and statutes, which I command you this day. And all these curses shall come unto thee and overtake thee. So she quotes that. And then she says, this is the result of disobedience and transgression. But all read carefully the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, realizing that it makes every difference to a people, whether they are obedient or disobedient to the law of Jehovah. Then she says the prophecies regarding Israel were fulfilled to the letter. God permitted his chosen people to be scattered as captives in strange lands. And when they repented, God took them to himself again and established them in his own land. But their continual disobedience resulted in their complete overthrow and in the overthrow of Jerusalem. So it it seems pretty clear here that she's connecting Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 again, and that they were fulfilled. For those that are willing to examine and to do so without preconceived notions. What Mrs. White is doing here is giving complete and total support to the understanding of the seven times that William Miller first presented. But she is expecting. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that, you know, Miller was 100% correct in how he derived the seven times. Right. Right. But, But definitely that seven times period exists. Right. I mean, it's pretty hard to argue that Vanessa's captivity is not beginning of is fulfilled by the first seven times, you know, the breaking of the pride of your power, because that's going to be the first time that the king of Judah is going to be taken captive. And we have it in 677. Right. And then and, and then we're going to have 70 years until Daniel's taken captive. And then that begins the 70 years captivity. So that the adding of the first seven times to the second seven times gives you a period of 140 years altogether. And it's going to end with uh, Cyrus coming to the throne as the first decree. And then the third seven times, <clears throat> um, well, that's going to be fulfilled, uh, you know, by Jehoiachin's captivity and 140 years later is going to be Artaxerxes' decree. And then the fourth seven times is going to be fulfilled with the destruction of the temple after a period of 420 years that it existed. And it's the the temple is going to rest for 70 years until it's dedicated again. For 70 years. And that 70 years that it lays, yeah, the temple is going to be uh, desolate for 70 years, and then it's going to be dedicated 490 years after the first temple was dedicated. And that's going to be connected to the decree of Darius. So the three decrees are all going to mark periods, the ending of periods of 70 years or 140 years, 
uh, and and these 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 periods are going to begin with Manasseh's captivity, the captivity of Daniel in the time of Jehoiakim, the captivity of Jehoiachin, and the captivity of Zedekiah, right? Which is the one where the temple is going to be destroyed. So, so if we have the correct Bible chronology, these things all fall into place. Now, if a person tries to argue, well, right. you know, seven times is not really you know, dealing with the 25, 20 year period. Well, I could say, yes, not directly, but indirectly it does. But, but because of what happened, because of how it was fulfilled. But in Leviticus 26 itself, it's not directly giving the 25, 20 year prophecy. That is, if you think about it, time could have happened, if things could have unfolded differently if God's people had been obedient, right? We know that, there, that there's a condition, conditionality to Leviticus 26. If you're not uh, reformed by these things, then, right? Right. It becomes, it becomes an if-then prophecy. It, it becomes conditional. Now, the fact that eventually it, it became periods of 25, 20 years, does it mean that, that it was directly a, a prophecy about 25, 20 years, like we would have with the 2300 days, right? It, it is a prophecy that's, that becomes a period of 25, 20 years, only because of how it's fulfilled. And, and, and then, of course, the prophecies of Daniel are going to address that and give not just the end, of those prophetic periods, the ends of those 70 years, because that's given in Daniel, but also going to give these blessings and curses, trans, transfer them to spiritual Israel, and extend them to the Millerite time period. And, and to me, it's just so beautiful. I mean, I, I just think it's amazing, uh, the 25, 20 year prophecy, once we understand it correctly, because we we see something more than Miller saw, right? It's new light in our time. Right. Um, but it, it makes old light shine brighter. It shows that the foundation was laid correctly, even though we didn't fully understand it. And that's the thing that I find disappointing is that those attacks at 2520, they don't like to, uh, well, I've never seen an attack of my presentation of Leviticus 26 and in any way. I mean, obviously I've had discussions where people will dismiss it, but you know, nobody's ever written about it. It's, they, they always attack Miller's. And even like Stephen Bohr, when he puts his attack on the 2520, he says, there is this other period, but I'm not going to address that. Well, it's absolutely necessary if he's going to make an attack on what people are teaching today. Right. Uh, that you can't just go back and take Miller's understanding and attack that. You obviously need to attack. You need to show that we are wrong in how we are addressing the 2520 today. And, and nobody does that. So you dropped out so, there. Yeah. yeah. So, so nobody has really addressed how we understand the 2520. Nobody's addressed the prophetic mirror, the two 2520s together. Correct. So Pruitt gives reference to Deuteronomy 28, the sister chapter of Leviticus 26. His statement continues, and what if Israel does not respond to these events, God's communication? He says that he will bring seven times more plagues where he puts times in brackets, even if we are looking at this directly from Scripture. Because if we're looking at this, we do not find the word italicized, so it's not a supplied word by the translators, but this is a, a translated situation into English. How would this read in the Hebrew? Well, well, as we noted that that um, you know the more does not actually uh, 
work in this way. So the way that in verse 18, it's going to say, I will prolong to punish you, seven for your sins. Okay. Um, so, the, so the thing is that's going to be intensified is, is the punishing, but you wouldn't put seven, seven times more for your sins. Okay. Right, because the more is the word yasif, it should be attached to the play to the um, uh, punish you. So I'm going to prolong to punish you, or I shall add to your punishing seven for your sins. But here, if you if you're going to take his translation, I shall bring seven more plagues. Right, if you put times in brackets like that. So is he arguing that there was seven plagues in the in the in each of these seven times. Interesting premise. Right. Now, Loughborough in, um, I think it's about, well, it's in the early 1900s, so the early 20th century. He writes in, I don't think it's the youth instructor, but it's some, some periodical like that. He does write an article on the seven times um, of Leviticus 26. And, and he argues that each one of them are seven uh, different. Each one has seven different punishments attached to it. So he uses it as the number seven, right, as being like seven plagues or seven chastisements. Okay. And all, all together, then he says there are 28 of those. Um, but he doesn't he doesn't label them. He doesn't take the time to say what they specifically are. And but I think it's pretty clear that it's not saying that there's going to be seven plagues or seven punishments. And then if, if you're not reformed by those, I'm going to give you seven more punishments, right? Right. Uh, but, but that's what you would have to do if you're going to say, if you're just going to put the times in those square brackets and just take it out, right? Now, it, now this is, of course, uh, the one in verse 21, right? Uh, we'll bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Now, in, in that verse, it's it's in the King James. It's translated in a different order than the 18th verse, but they're actually in the same order in verse 18 and verse uh, 21. Except, um, so this would actually be Yasaf Shibab. Yes. Yep. And and plagues is going to come before that, so it's going to be Yasaf is is going to be the plagues. Right. So yeah. So uh, so it's going to be um, yeah. So you have plagues in between there. Same same in verse eighteen. You have Yasaf, then you have um, Yasar, and then Sheba. Right. So you're going to have seven after this. So if you put this in the order, it would be I will bring more plagues seven or Prolong your plagues, seven, upon you, according to your sins, right? So, so again, in both cases, it's not in the same order as Hebrew, but there, this is a different order than verse 18, right? Verse 18 is going to, I will punish you seven times more for your sins, is the way that verse 18, but there's still really the same sentence structure in Hebrew. And, and so the, the word seven is going to stand on its own. I mean, in a sense, the times is an added word. That is, it, it, it should not be there. But they put it there, partly they're trying to make this make sense in English. Now, they could have put uh, sevenfold instead of just the word seven. But that would be a mistranslation of the word seven because it's not sevenfold. We have another word for sevenfold so in, in Hebrew. So they, they take the word Sheba and it's modified to become sevenfold. So the best way to translate is I will bring, and, and then the word bring here, you look at, uh, I know this, is, this gets really technical, and I apologize for this, but so when you look at, uh, uh, the Hebrew. So the King James is a little bit of, they're trying to make these always make sense. But in verse 21, it says in the King James, if you walk contrary unto me, I will, and will not hearken unto me, 
I will bring seven times more plagues on you according to your sins. But in the Hebrew, it's going to have this order, and I'm waiting for my computer to switch. Okay. So it's going to have this order where it goes. So if you do not hear, then it says yasaf, all. So that's the word um, by. So I'm going to uh, yasaf, that is by. A maka is the word for plagues, right? Pestilence, figuratively carnage. It means a blow, right, of the flail. So it's uh, basically it's a blow, a plague, a slaughter, smoke, a stripe, a stroke, a wound. Um, so it's saying that I'm going to prolong this, right? That's the word yasuf. Um, and then seven, according to your sins, right? So that's what's going to be said here in Hebrew. So again, it's just like verse 18, but it doesn't say bring. And and so, you know, there's an inconsistency in the King James when they put added words um, in italics. True. Um, I mean, you could say, Against maybe is in there, so maybe they're using that word five five nine two one. I think is the word that they're translating as bring, but they don't show that right. So what they show is uh, they show um, upon. They use the word upon plagues upon you, but I will bring seven times more. The word bring is not there, right? So, you know, I will bring against you, uh, I guess the best way to translate that is I will uh, prolong against you seven, uh, or I will prolong uh, the plagues upon you seven for your sins is best, the best way to translate it. I will, yeah, I will prolong the plagues upon you seven for your sins. That would make the most sense. So it just means that it's a period of time that's going to be extended. Because I don't think you, you could just take this, that it's going to be seven seven different plagues. And, and definitely it's not um, intensity. There's nothing there that would ex- suggest, you know, seven is not intensity. And the word that's translated as more, yasaf, is not intensity. The intensity doesn't come from seven or from more. Hopefully that helps people. I know it's it's rather complicated, but well, it can be complicated, yes, but it's also following Miller's rules. Because in the way that Smith has approached this and the way that Pruitt is approaching it, they are both setting aside Miller's rules in the way that they're considering these verses. Well, they're not considering their fulfillment. Like they're dismissing their fulfillment that Miller has given or other people have given. Um, and, and Pruitt's going to try in some ways to sort of address this. But, but he, doesn't, he doesn't say, well, the first seven times is fulfilled this way and the second is this way and the third is this way and the fourth is this way. He just kind of has this general idea that, this, that God uh, uses these. But if you think about it logically, I mean, if there is a first seven times, and there's a second, and there's a third, and there's a fourth, and these are progressive uh, chastisements, as the Ellen White quote says, severe and more se- yet more severe chastisements were to be afflicted. Then the, and, and then she's going to, of course, she lists Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Wouldn't we try to find their fulfillment? Right. What, what most people do is just kind of dismiss it's not even a prophecy. That's what a lot of people try to say. It's not, it's not a prophecy, which of course it is. Um, at least Pruitt seems to think it's a prophecy, but he's not looking for its fulfillment. He's not trying to say, well, in which way was this fulfilled? That they, they, That God gave a chastisement and they didn't obey and then he gave this other chastisement. And and the details of this are there, right? I'll break the pride of your power, right? Uh, I'll send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children. Well, 
That's Daniel's captivity, right? The wild beasts being the nations, the uh, symbol of the nations. So obviously it's going to apply to, to Babylon in this case. Um, and if you're not reformed by these, you know, then I'm going to bring a sword upon you, right. avenge you, avenge the quarrel of my covenant when you're gathered together within your city. So this is the siege, right? Uh, and then the fourth one, which is going to be all of these things combined. They're going to be scattered among the nations and so forth, right? So nobody is, is looking for their fulfillment as, as if it is fulfilled, has been fulfilled. And, and that's all I did is I just said, well, if it was fulfilled, when was it fulfilled? How was it fulfilled? And as I did that, I saw that there were periods of 70 years connected to it. All right. Through its comments. The curse foretold by the term seven is not only finite, it is proportional to the sins of the people. Items of the curse already listed can be like that. A famine appropriate to the rebellion, a captivity consummate with the evil, a military loss as the result of unfaithfulness, can all can be upon you according to your sins. But what about the 2,520 years that span two different bodies of God's people? Did God threaten a certain generation that if it would not hearken, it would receive a punishment of a captivity lasting more than 2,000 years? Why is it that it is so simple for them to accept the 1,260 days or the 42 months, but not give credence to an understanding of the 2520. Yeah. Now, of course, God did not threaten a certain generation with a punishment that's going to last or a captivity lasting more than 2,000 years, right? So, I mean, obviously that's ridiculous. But, okay. But but what we're going to have is we're going to have for Leviticus 26 for, for Israel and Judah, that there is going to be a punishment that's going to last for 70 years and more, right? Right. But but as you, you make the point, there's these two periods of 1260 years. Now, of course, that that's not going to be given to a Hoshia. He's not going to be given a message that he's going to be in captivity uh, for 1260 years personally. So, I mean, it, it's kind of a ridiculous idea what about 2300 days right it did did god he's going to say it's going to be 2300 years until the sanctuary is cleansed i mean that's pretty clear that lasts for more than 2000 years but see and this is this is the other point that that i've had to look at multiple times miller's assessment that from 677 to its termination was a period of 2,520 years. So as we have looked at this in the past, we would have from 677 BC to 1844. Now, the thing that is set aside is the promise of the 220. They have no problem. Yeah, the, the restoration. Correct. Yeah, and, and that's my whole point is that, well, yes, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the people who go into captivity, they're not going to wait 25, 20 years to get out of captivity. They're going to have 70 years. But if you just take the 25, 20 by itself and you don't recognize that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are different portions of that period, then, yeah, I guess you could argue against it as sort of, you know, what would be the purpose of it. But the fact is the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are necessary in order for the 25, 20 years to exist. That they only exist because of Daniel's prophecies, right? So that's why in Leviticus 26, we don't have directly a 25, 20 year prophecy. I mean, that wouldn't be very meaningful if, if that was given way back then. But 
with Daniel's prophecies, we definitely do see 2,300 years. The sanctuary being cleansed, that's going to be put off for 2,300 years. If, right. if, we, if we made that argument that he's making with the 2,300 so years, would we accept his it? Statement, his statement here, did God threaten a certain generation that if it would not hearken, it would receive a punishment of a captivity lasting more than 2,000 years? to me just doesn't hold water because they were without their temple, the thing that they were the most proud of. The Ten Commandments speak of a visitation of sins in the third and the fourth generation. That kind of visitation is apparent in the captivity that followed Hezekiah and the one that followed Josiah. But it is God's mercies that extended to a thousand generations, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Now, one thing here, too, um, people often say, well, how can God curse, you know, for such a long period of time? Okay. But wasn't the earth cursed for 6,000 years? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, obviously, that we know that the, there's this... Uh, third and fourth generation, but 6,000 years covers more than uh, the third and fourth generation. And and we also know that, again, the 2,300 years, that's definitely more than three or four generations. So it, it, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot here. In trying to attack the 2520, you're also inadvertently, and maybe sometimes not so in, inadvertently, Backing the 2300 days. Okay. In addition to the seven times more plagues of verse 21, God added, I will also send wild beasts among you, and your highways shall be desolate. The word also gives credit to Smith's reasoning. What is the also referring back to? The last item prior is the seven times more plagues. And it becomes clearer. Continuing from the word desolate. So, except the word also does not exist in the Hebrew. Right. It doesn't say also. All right. Right. It's it's just something they add in the King James to give a flow of continuity. But there's there's no word there in Hebrew that means also. There's no form of a word that all that gives also. It's, it's just something they add. I mean, they, they should have italicized the word. Right. They didn't. Yeah, because this is, I mean, it, it would make more sense if it just said, I will send wild beasts among you. Yeah, and, and, and really, almost the very few other translations put the word also there. The only ones that do are the ones based on the King James. Okay. Right. But all the other translations just say, uh, or pretty much all, all of them just say, I will send wild beasts among you. It doesn't put the word also there because it doesn't exist in the Hebrew. Okay. So here Pruitt is being proper in italicizing also. Well, so he's putting that for emphasis though. Right. I know. Yeah, and, and bolding as well. But to make an additional word, the hinge, the the pin as it is, to say that Smith is right, is fairly a, a, a weak argument. Yep. Now, he quotes 26, 23 to 24. And if he will not be reformed by me by these things, but if but will walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Now, is the also here in verse 24 an added word or is that a, uh, is that proper? According to Esau. Yeah, that's, that's actually there. That word is there. Right. Yeah. So there we do have the word also. Yeah, it means also or gay, right? Um, moreover, right? 
meaning accession used as an adverb or conjunction, right? So, yeah. Now, of course, we're not going to have the word Yasef here anymore in the last two of the seven times. Okay. So we're going to have we're going to have the word yet uh, yet seven times for your sins. But notice we don't have more. So you can't say I will punish you uh, seven times more for your so, sins here. It doesn't have the word Yasef. So but it has the word yet. And as so, I'm looking at this. In verse 24, the Hebrew word that is translated also, that is shown as we're, as we're studying this right now, is Hebrew 637, af, right? AF? Yep. Now, going through what we, we are and have done in the past in the symbolic use of numbers, if I was to multiply six by three by seven, what would I come out with? One twenty-six. Yeah. So now the other thing is just so in uh, Stephen Jameson's study. Yes. Um, well, not his study, but his his chart there that he put. Um, uh, We've always done. Yeah, on, in WhatsApp. Right. So he he put that chart there. Right. So we, we we should probably bring that up. I don't know. Um, I could do that. Let me see here. Uh, I don't know. Aran, could you bring it up? The chart in WhatsApp that Stephen put up uh, yesterday. Uh, let me check. So it's in the Unity group. Because um, I think this is important just in what you referred to there, Dwight. So um, while he's getting that up. So basically... But back in 2014, I'd noticed this 13 years and 36 years that okay. divide the, the first the first seven weeks of the 70 week prophecy. Right. Right. So because there's 13 years from the seventh year of Artaxerxes to the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Right. So from 457 BC to 444 BC. And that's that 52 days of, in Nehemiah that we divided as three days and 49 days. Right. Right. From the fourth day of the fifth month to the 25th day of the sixth month. That's how we looked at it. We did the three days inclusive. Um, you know, so it's really the third day. But anyways, but it's three days, right? So from the fourth to the sixth. And then you have 49 days from... So all of it's an inclusive count. So so anyway, back then, that 30, 13 years and the 36, what I'd done is I'd multiplied 36 by 49 to get 1,764 years, which I counted from 34 AD to 1798. Then the 13 years, I had multiplied those, what did I do? Yeah, so the 13 years, I'd multiplied by the 36 years, and that gave me 468 years from 70 AD to 5, 538. So the 13 times 12. And then uh, now what Stephen has done, okay, so then what Stephen's going to do is he's going to multiply the 13 by 49, and he's going to get uh, 637 years. If you can just explode that a bit. There you go. Zoom in. Yeah. So you can see what he's done is he's got the the, the seventy week prophecy, the first seven weeks. You can see there's forty nine years. Now he's he's gonna do an inclusive count as thirty seven years, right, instead of just the thirty six. So he has thirteen and thirty seven to make uh fifty a Jubilee, right? And then on the bottom he's gonna have uh from 607 to 1844, that's going to be the Jubilee of Jubilees, right? That's the 50th Jubilee. That's going to be for 2,450 years. And that you could take 13 times 49, that would give you from 607 to 3180, right? You can see that there. And that's, you know, 637 years. That's that, that number, right? So... So, so I mean, that was 
pretty interesting there. So what we have is if we take the number 637, right, we can get 126 out of it, right, 6 times 3 times 7. But we also have the number 637 itself, which is the period of time from Daniel's captivity to the cross. Okay, does that make sense to people? So that symbol of 637 um, relates to 637 years. Okay, does that make, has anybody got any problems with that? It's also 13 times 49. Six times three times seven is the same as 13 times 49. It's 637. Or oh, pardon me, it's not six times three times seven. Six, 637 is 126. Six times three times seven is 126. But it right. relates to this period of 637 years, so 13 times 49. So six times three times seven gives us 126, which obviously represents the, the 2520. Right. Um, and the 1260, but also it it is the number of years from 607 to 31 AD, just to make that clear. And then if we go 36 times 49, uh, we get the period from uh, 34 AD with the stoning of Stephen to 1798. And what 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 Stephen has done here is he's taken an inclusive count from 31 AD. It, um, 1844, which is, um, I guess he's doing the inclusive count from 444 BC to 408, and then multiplying it by 49 to get the number of years from 31 AD to 1844. So 37 times 49. Now he's also going to have um, the 52 days that we have with uh, the Passover to Pentecost. Right. And the 52 days of Nehemiah having this parallel, so that's another part of this study. But um, we, you know, we're not we're not focused on that right now. But, but that's the other part of what this chart is about. Okay, so the 637 there is pretty important in the context of Leviticus 26. That also, I would say it's kind of extremely important. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions with what we've covered so far today? I mean, there's a lot here, right? In, yeah. In this, in this. Um, I, I just want to make a comment about verse 24, where it says, "I will punish you yet seven for your sins." Right. Now, because because the word Yasef isn't there, but we have another word yet. Um, now the word. The word yasef meant to add, and, and since the first two seven times have that add or lengthen or prolong, right? Um, that's why we can add the two together to get a period of 140 years. That is, they are consecutive, right? You have 70 years from Manasseh to Daniel's captivity, and then 70 years from Daniel's captivity to the end of the Babylonian captivity, right? Right. So, so those two add together. But the word yet means while something is still happening, this is going to commence. So after Daniel's taken captive, we don't wait 70 years for the third seven times. We, it's going to happen 10 years later that Jehoiachin is taken captive. So that's why it has the word yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, and then the four seven times isn't going to have yes of or yet, right? Because it's going to complete um, these chastisements. Okay. So it's just it, it's it's no there you know, there is details of these words. Yeah, and and you have these little details that you know people just skip over, and yet you have you know Eugene Pruitt, you know taking the word also and making a big deal about it, even though it's not in the Hebrew. Okay. Any other comment or thought at this point? Okay, we'll leave off here and return to it tomorrow. So shall we close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you 
for this time that we've spent together where we can come together and address these things openly, directly, with other like-minded believers. Help us now in the course of our day. Show us that which we need to do that will most glorify you. Direct us to these ends. For this we ask, for this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.